Hi, my name is Luigi Adamo. I'm a heart failure specialist. In the next 10 to 15 minutes, I will present a practical review of heart failure prevention and treatment for the non-cardiologist. Just in the US, more than 6 million are living with heart failure and about 1 million people are diagnosed each year. Heart failure is a very serious disease. More than 40% of patients die within five years from diagnosis. The good news is that we have learned much about heart failure and now we have several tools to prevent and treat it. Unfortunately though, many of these tools remain underutilized. So I would like to review the main pillars of evidence-based heart failure management with the non-specialist in mind, with the goal of, of help closing any gap there, there might be between current practice and the recommended heart failure treatment guidelines. So let us begin. First, what is heart failure? Heart failure is a condition characterized by exercise intolerance, shortness of breath, and fluid retention, secondary to a disease in the heart. Any patient with these symptoms could have heart failure. Patients with heart failure are classified based on their left ventricular ejection fraction, or EF. A normal EF is greater than 50%. About half of heart failure patients have a clearly reduced EF, meaning that their EF is less than 40%. And so these patients have been referred to as patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. The other half of patients with heart failure have a normal EF that is greater than 50%. These patients have a heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Patients that have an EF between 40 and 50% are receiving a lot of attention and they are an ongoing area of investigation. But from a practical point of view, we can lump them together with the patient with reduced EF. So in short, the treatment of heart failure, regardless of the cause, can be classified based on ejection fraction, greater than 50% or lower than 50%. So how to diagnose heart failure? Heart failure is a clinical diagnosis. There is not a single test that can diagnose heart failure. There are some blood tests like the natriuretic peptides that are very useful to diagnose heart failure, the BMP and the nt pmb In fact, when patients with heart failure are decompensated, that is, they are fluid overloaded, they often have elevated plasma levels of these peptides. However, Neither of these two tests is 100% sensitive or specific for heart failure. In fact, when patients are properly diuresed, the BMP and nt BMP, they drop significantly and may even normalize, especially in patients with preserved ejection fraction. Moreover, natriuretic peptides levels can be low even with the compensated heart failure, for instance, in obese patients, or they can be elevated in the absence of the compensated heart failure, for instance, in atrial fibrillation, or severe renal dysfunction. Now we'll discuss how to treat heart failure, first with the reduced ejection fraction and then with preserved ejection fraction. So let's first discuss pharmacologic therapy as we talk about heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. From a practical point of view, it is essential to appreciate that there are only four classes of drugs that have been shown to reduce mortality in heart failure patients with reduced ejection fraction. Beta blockers, ACE inhibitors or ARBs, angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitors, that is ARNIS or Antresto, and aldosterone antagonists. An often overlooked concept is that when using these drugs, those matters. Heart failure drugs should be prescribed at the maximum tolerated dose within the recommended range. Another key concept is that diuretics have not clearly been shown to reduce mortality. So use them at the minimum necessary dose to control congestion. The beta blockers that have been studied in heart failure are carbedilo with a gold dose of 25 milligrams twice a day, metoprolol succinate, extended release with a gold dose of 200 milligrams daily, and bisoprolol with a gold dose of 10 milligrams daily. There is no place for immediate release metoprolol in the treatment of heart failure because this drug has never been studied for this indication. Beta blockers should be up titrated to the gold dose mentioned earlier, or if this is not possible, to the maximum tolerated dose. There is not a specific heart rate target for it. The most commonly used ACE inhibitor in the US is lisinopril with a target dose of 40 mg daily. The presence of chronic kidney disease is not a contraindication to the use of ACE inhibitors. ACE inhibitors reduce glomerular filtration rate, this is expected, and they increase the creatinine slightly. But even in the presence of severe chronic kidney disease, 
with appropriate monitoring of electrolytes, the benefits of ACE inhibitors clearly outweigh the risks. Beta blockers and ACE inhibitors, they can be started together and slowly up titrated. ARBs are less effective than ACE inhibitors. They should be used only if ACE inhibitors are not tolerated, for instance, if they cause a cough. For patients who remain symptomatic despite treatment with beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, and loop diuretics, such as furosemide, torsemide, or bumetanate, the first option is to substitute an ARNI, an Tresto, for the ACE inhibitor. The other option is to start a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, that is an MRA. The MRA is studied in heart failure are spironolactone and eplerenone, and the goal dose for both of them is 50 mg daily. MRAs cannot be used in patients with a glomerular filtration rate of less than 30 milliliters per minute or with serum potassium that is more than 5 milliequivalents per milliliter. An MRA can be added on top of beta blockers plus an ARNI in persistently symptomatic patients. In black patients who remain symptomatic despite treatment with beta blockers and all the other drugs that we've discussed so far at the maximum tolerated dose, we should add hydrazine isosorbate at a gold dose of 40 milligrams of hydrazine and 70 of isosorbate three times a day, because this treatment has been shown to reduce mortality further in this patient subgroup. Diuretics should be used to control signs and symptoms of congestion at the minimum necessary dose, and if at all possible, avoid trading a higher dose of the disease-modified drugs that we've discussed so far for a higher dose of diuretic. Patients who experience an improvement in ejection fraction in response to therapy should be continued on pharmacologic treatment even if their LVF normalizes. In addition to pharmacologic therapy, there are several non-pharmacologic interventions that can help for your patients and that we should discuss at this point. First, encourage patients with their failure to maintain a healthy body weight and maintain a good level of activity as they are able. Any exercise that makes you so short of breath that you cannot talk is too intense if you have heart failure. We should remind our patients that in heart failure, there is no second wind. When patients are tired, they should take a break. Patients should also limit their intake of sodium, which promotes fluid retention and increases the need for diuretics. Please advise heart failure patients to check their weight each morning and to call their practitioner if they gain more than three pounds in four days as this typically indicates fluid retention and a need to escalate the dose of loop diuretics. Heart failure patients with a reduced ejection fraction and a left bundle branch block with a QRS over 150 milliseconds on the EKG should be referred to a specialist for evaluation of possible cardiac resynchronization therapy. And patients with an EF of 35% or lower should be referred for consideration of an automated implantable cardioverter defibrillator or ICD for prevention of sudden cardiac death. NSAIDs, such as ibuprofen or naproxen, and other drugs that like deltiazem are contraindicated in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction because they can, respectively, cause fluid retention or a reduction in cardiac performance. It is unfortunately quite common to see patients with heart failure end up in the hospital because they took NSAIDs either over the counter or following a prescription. There are a few additional things to look out for. Look out for patients who do not tolerate high doses of heart failure medications or who need escalating doses of diuretics, as well as patients who have hyponatremia and patients who have recurrent hospitalization for heart failure. All these patients should be referred promptly to a heart failure specialist. These signs, in fact, might suggest advanced disease and therefore the need for a ventricular assist device or cardiac transplant should be assessed promptly. Patients with heart failure and atrial fibrillation should also need special attention and should be referred to a specialist because there is emerging evidence suggesting that for these patients, a rhythm control strategy might be better than a rate control strategy. So now let's discuss how to treat heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. There are no evidence-based therapies for the treatment of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. The only treatments are diuretics to control symptoms and management of comorbidities such as hypertension, obesity, and sleep apnea. There is no evidence to support the use of any of the other therapies that we've discussed for patients with reduced ejection fraction, with the exception of limited evidence suggesting that MRAs might be of benefit, but the data is inconsistent. 
Heart failure patients with reduced TF often have chronotropic incompetence. That is an inability to increase heart rate appropriately with exercise. So treatment with beta blockers might be detrimental. Moreover, the use of nitrates has been shown to increase mortality in heart failure patients with preserved DF. The diagnosis of heart failure with preserved DF can be challenging. Patients with this condition typically are obese, hypertensive, they have atrial fibrillation, and they have signs of congestion on echocardiogram. A patient that does not have all of these characteristics should be probably referred to a specialist to receive a diagnosis of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and make sure that we are not missing a different diagnosis. I'll discuss two more points to close this talk or this presentation. First, what to do with asymptomatic patients with an ejection fraction less than 50%. Unless there are strong contraindications, each patient with an ejection fraction under 50% should be treated with an ACE inhibitor. If this is not tolerated, should be treated then with an angiotensin receptor blocker, even if the patient is completely asymptomatic. Treatment of comorbidities such as hypertension and to a lesser extent diabetes reduces the rate of progression to clinical heart failure. Since a reduced ejection fraction is abnormal until proven otherwise, patients with an incidental finding of reduced ejection fraction should be promptly referred to a cardiologist for evaluation, independently of having symptoms of heart failure. Last point, what can we do to prevent heart failure? Major risk factors for the development of heart failure are obesity, coronary artery disease, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, lack of physical activity, excessive alcohol intake, and family history of heart failure. Prevention of heart failure therefore starts with a healthy lifestyle and treatment of comorbidities. General practitioners have the task of advising patients on how to prevent heart failure, identifying asymptomatic patients with reduced TF, and initiating appropriate therapy or referral. So in summary, we'll review what we've discussed so far in seven points. First, to prevent heart failure, advise patients regarding diet, exercise, and alcohol intake. Second, heart failure is a clinical diagnosis. Do not rely on any single blood test to rule it in or out. Third, in addition to lifestyle modifications, every patient with heart failure with ejection fraction less than 50% should be treated with a beta blocker and an ACE inhibitor, an ARB or an ARNI. This medication should be pushed to recommended gold doses as far as the patient tolerates them. Fourth, diuretics should be used in heart failure only as needed to control congestion. Fifth, NSAIDs and diltiazem are contraindicated in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Sixth, refer to a cardiologist any heart failure patient with reduced ejection fraction for an initial evaluation. Refer also patients with recurrent need for hospitalization those with a left bundle branch block with a QRS interval over 150 milliseconds, those with atrial fibrillation, as well as any patient who you suspect might have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, but does not have all of its typical comorbidities. Last point, number seven, the treatment of patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is based on decongestion with diuretics. MRA has been beneficial. The other drugs used to treat patients with reduced TF have not been shown to help and might actually produce harm in this patient group. Thanks for your attention, and I hope that this information will help you deliver better care to your patients.